right, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm going to go through quite a few things here. Uh, I've got a lot of slides, so we'll try to uh, go through them fairly quickly so that we have time to get to some questions. Uh, first of all, just a little bit of background. Uh, my brother Brian and I, uh, we farm right here in South Central Nebraska. It's uh, almost uh, exact center, geographical center of the United States, so we're right in the middle of everything right there. Uh, we've been no-tilling for over 25 years now. We're about two-thirds dry land and a third irrigated. Primarily in our area, it is a corn, bean, sometimes cereal rotation, especially in the dry land. Recently, since we've started doing cover crops and uh, have the ability to sell some of these things for our seed business, we've added rye, triticale, oats, barley, veg, sunflowers, and buckwheat to our rotation. So we're trying to diversify uh, in what we do ourselves as much as possible. Uh, we've been doing cover crops for about eight years, and we started green pepper seed in 2009 and uh, it's grown fairly quickly. Uh, this is a picture of the facility right now. In 2011, this is all farm ground. So this has all been built uh, since 2011 for the cover crop business. I do want, I like to put this slide in here because you know you may all be from the Great Plains, but you're certainly not from South Central Nebraska. And so I really like this quote from Emerson where he says, as the methods there may be a million and then some, the principles are few. And the man who can grasp the principles can successfully select their own methods. But the man who tries the methods, ignoring the principles, is sure to have problems. So in other words, the, the principles that you're learning and hearing here at this conference are going to apply to all soils uh, everywhere. The methods that you may see me talk, talking about, or Trey, or other people, uh, they may not work for you. You may have to figure out other methods to make the same principles work. The, the principles of soil health uh, are going to work. So first of all, a couple basic understandings. Cover crops are unlikely to work well if you try to squeeze them into an already existing system of rotation without making other changes to the system. In other words, uh, we have people come to us all the time and, and they've got, you know, and, and again in our area it's a lot of just corn bean. And uh, they come and they want to put a cover crop in, but they're not willing to change anything else in their system or the rotation it's unlikely that they're going to have a lot of success because that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, it, it really comes down to having to have a highly managed systems approach to cover crops and soil health. And there are some other things that you have to do to tweak your existing rotation, your existing management to make cover crops work. And if you do that, I think you can have a lot of success, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. So, so again, it's not cover crops aren't something that you can just drop into an existing system and have it work very successfully right at first. It takes a lot of management. Now, cover crops are easy if you have wheat in the rotation and you can plant them in July or August. So that's like pushing the easy button on cover crops because when you plant cover crops in July or August, there's, there's lots of things that are going to work. And there's lots of time for things to grow. And there's lots of biomass above and below the ground. And there's lots of benefits. About the only thing that can make you fail with cover crops in July and August is if you just absolutely have no rain. Right, Dan? You can testify to that. And we, and we have all been there. But you don't know when that's going to happen, so you need to be prepared to plant those. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about cover crops after wheat harvest or after pea harvest or after any summer harvesting crop, because like I say, that's really pretty simple and that's really pretty easy, and we can make something that will be a great cover crop for you in that situation. So because that's so easy, I'm going to leave that to later, and we're going to talk about a little bit more challenging aspect, and, and even though this is high plains, there's still a lot of the high plains that are stuck in corn bean rotation. So I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we have done it on our own operation, that we've worked with others, to try to help uh, get cover crops into this rotation, and we'll talk a little bit about the importance of diversity later on, diversifying that rotation. But the problem is, is that in a corn bean rotation, you just simply run out of time, not only to plant cover crops, but to allow them to grow as well. And so I come to you today with good news, because we have a new cover crop. And it, you can plant it as late as you want. It overwinters great, but it's not a challenge to control in the spring. It fixes N, P, and K, and whatever else you might need, it's going to grow tons of biomass, but it is not going to be a problem to plant into. It fixes compaction, pH, and salinity, and it's very inexpensive. And aren't you glad that you came here to learn about this new cover crop? 
Here's what it looks like. <laughs> Obviously, there is no cover crop that is going to do all those things, but people think that there is, and they're continually asking for something to do all of those things, and it just physically is not possible. I'm sorry to tell you. And so, you know, people want the magic beans, and there really is no magic beans when it comes to this. You, you know, we still have to follow good, solid agricultural <laughs> principles. And again, it's a systems approach to making this whole thing work. So, when I talk about this concept, you know, we talk about a short window of time in which to plant cover crops in a corn bean rotation. So, there are some things that you can do that I, I, I call opening the window a little wider. Because in the short window of time, anything that you can do to open that window a little bit wider gives you opportunities that you would not have ordinarily had. So the concepts like planting shorter season varieties, especially soybeans, you know, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, in our area, you know, we've gone from planting three, two, three, five soybeans to planting a lot of two fours and two fives. Have seen very little decrease in yield, and in fact, some cases they've been the top yielding beans around. And uh, it gives us more time to come off earlier. We can get our cover crops in a little sooner. Same way with corn. You know, you can trim back your corn varieties a little bit without sacrificing much yield because there's some really good shorter season corn varieties. And maybe even consider planting those fields first. So if you've got a field that you know you want to plant cover crops into, plant that corn field first and maybe trim, you know, instead of doing 112 day, consider 105 day, plant it first. You may, get, you may pick up two weeks in the fall of good growing weather for your cover crop. And that makes a huge difference. Because if you can pick up some growing days in August or September versus October and November, it makes a huge difference in the amount of cover crop benefits that you'll get. Uh, aerial seeding is a possibility. It's kind of hit and miss, especially with dry land or low rainfall. It works less and less as you move west unless you're irrigated. Timing is very critical. If you go too early, you'll, 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 have, you'll suffer from lack of sunlight with those small plants. If you go too late, the growth will be limited. So aerial seeding, a lot of people ask about it, a lot of people are trying it. It can work well, it just does not work well consistently. It's very weather dependent. And so we still see a fair amount of people doing that. It, it is better if you have irrigation or higher rainfall. You can use the most pole tolerant species possible for your area. So for example, cereal rye, we've still got guys planting cereal rye, you know, all the way up through the end of November. We've even planted some in the middle of December. You sure don't see much in the fall, but it's going to be there in the spring. And your ryegrass, you know, we feel like in our area, South Central Nebraska, we need to have that in by September 15th to 25th to really have best results, especially for overwintering. Uh, it's not a very consistent overwintering plant if it does not get some establishment in the fall. Oats really needs to be in prior to the middle of September, radish or rapeseed canola. So depending on when you get these crops out, it depends on what you can use. And again, that's why if you shorten up the season on some of these things, it gives you a few more things that you can choose from. Hairy batch, we like to you know see you know in by the first of October, uh, ideally, but we've seeded it a little bit later and, and still had some uh, decent success. The later you get these things planted, the slower the growth will be in the spring, and so the more important it is that you get a time to grow more in the spring. Winter peas are kind of hit and miss. Uh, Paul's probably had as much success with winter peas as anybody I know, but one of the things that he does is he plants them deep. He'll plant his winter peas four inches deep if he could. Uh, if he can, and he'd probably go six inches deep if the drill would do it. Uh, he's a big, build a bigger drill, Paul. Uh, but they will overwinter much, much better if they're planted deep, which is great, but then you really can't put them in a mix. Winter lentils, we've had some success with. Crimson clover works decent further south. Melanza clover, I got, I got some pictures here I'll show you. These are some plots that we put in in October of 2015. The pictures are all from the spring. Uh, 2000, the winter of 2015, 2016 was pretty mild for us. And so I've actually got some pictures of things working that normally would not work in our area. Uh, we're at about 40 degrees latitude, but they will work further south and they will work uh, as you, you know, up in our area on, on better year <coughs> over year where we get better snow cover. So this is the Lancet Clover, uh, April 1st. And it doesn't look all that impressive, but uh, five weeks later, it really exploded and it really grew a lot. And we had a, a, a significant amount of clover growth out there. Balanza clover, this is fixation balanza. 
It's one of the most cold tolerant annual clovers that there is. It's far more cold tolerant than crimson clover. Uh, it grows kind of slow and then it kind of hits a certain point and it really takes off and grows quite fast. So Balanza is one thing that can be planted a little later and shows some promise there. Austrian winter peas, like I said, uh, is hit and miss this year. It was, it was hit because we had a relatively mild winter and had, had some snow cover when we got our coldest temperatures of the year. Uh, so we were in full bloom by the, the 11th of May this particular year. And this was a relatively warm spring as well, so things were uh, more mature than they normally would have been uh, in some years. Here's a couple kinds of crimson clover. My daughter Anna Hope there uh, with her Husker shirt. We, we can finally show our Husker shirts again. We got Hope again after hiring a new coach. But this, I show this picture because it's kind of interesting because everybody's used to seeing the red crimson clover like that. On the left there is a uh, white cloud crimson clover. It's uh, I think to my knowledge it's the only white blossom crimson clover that there is. Uh, Orgro and, and Oregon developed that, uh, so kind of interesting. We will not normally see crimson clover over winter like this, although I desperately wish we could because it's a great cover crop, it's a cheap clover, uh, it's, it's just not consistently overwintering at where we're at. Hairy vetch, hairy vetch is by far the best overwintering cover crop uh, for a lagoon that we have. You can see uh, May 11th, it was like this in 2016. Here's a picture from a, an organic farmer at Heber in Nebraska, uh, about 60 miles from us. We're going to have some pictures of this later of what he's done here. But this is Harry Batch that was planted relatively late last fall, or, or 2016. And then uh, this is a picture of him planting his corn into this June 7th. And uh, it's, 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 that's a lot of growth. That's a lot of Harry Batch out there. I'll show you later how good of a kill he got simply by running that crimper. Again, he's organic, so he has no spray options. But that gives you an idea of the kind of growth that you can get on hairy vetch. And this was a much, uh, winter of 16 and 17 was a harsher winter than 15 and 16 was. So, but he still got this kind of growth. Now, if he would have got his hairy vetch planted uh, October 1st instead of October 25th, he would have had the same picture probably two weeks earlier. He would be an organic, he had to let it grow because this is his nitrogen for his corn. It's also his weed control. And I got pictures later to show you what kind of kill he got on that. Winter lentils uh, seem to be a little more consistent than winter peas. These are more than winter lentils, and uh, they they have some uh, potential fits in there as well. Winter oats, we don't usually get winter oats to overwinter where we're at, but this particular year they did. So again, it might be an option uh, for some of you further south. Annual ryegrass, again, uh, it, it did well this, this particular year. Winter barley is one that we're looking at, and then later on we'll talk about some of the issues of planting corn in the cereal rye. But winter barley is one that we're looking at as a potential cover crop ahead of corn uh, because it's a little less alleliopathic. There's less risk of nutrient tie-up because it doesn't get as tall or as big, or it doesn't get away from you as quick as what cereal rye does. But because of that, it's not quite as good a weed control. It's not quite as winter hardy as a uh, cereal rye, but it's, by, it's far more winter party than winter oats. Uh, there are some new varieties coming out. We're trying a new one this year that uh, they've had some success growing in Montana. And I figure if it can survive a Montana winter, it should have no problems with the Nebraska winter. Uh, University of Nebraska is going to be coming out with some new winter barley varieties in the next couple of years as well. So we think winter barley may have a good fit in our rotation. Uh, plant it after soybeans and then to plant corn into it. Because I'll show you pictures here later of where we planted corn into cereal rye, and it can work, but it, it requires a higher level of management because there are some things that, that can go wrong with that. Uh, here's, here's just a picture of winter barley in comparison to triticale. It's a little hard to get perspective here, but this triticale is probably a foot taller than, than the barley. They're both headed out May 11th. Again, this, this Oh, this should, uh, should have been uh, 2016 here. I didn't plan it. <laughs> yeah, that would be good if I could make that work. But it does not get as tall as triticale, but it is earlier. Winter barley will be one of the first winter cereals to mature. Uh, another thing that you can do is use the right varieties. Uh, for example, when we sell cereal rye, or when we use cereal rye, we use a variety called Elbon that was developed by the Noble Foundation down in Oklahoma. 
And we like it because it has a very short dormancy period. Because it was bred in Oklahoma, it was bred for Oklahoma winters, and it was bred for forage production. So it grows later into the fall than what your Canadian type rye will, and it starts greening up and growing earlier in the spring than what the northern rye did. And because of that, it's silver and winter hardy. We've never seen a winter kill, but because of it, it, it gets to a more mature stage faster than the other types of rye. So when you're spraying it out, it'll be a little bit more lignified. So as it's dying, you get more residue left in the field than what you would with the northern varieties. The other benefit to it is generally a smaller seed size. Uh, it averages 22 to 24,000 seeds per pound already, where a lot of the northern rice can be around 18,000 seeds per pound. So you get more plants per pound of seed. Here's just another comparison, May 11th. Again, it's a little hard to tell the perspective here, but the Elbon uh, is, is starting to head out. The northern rye is not. The Elbon is probably 8 to 12 inches taller than the northern rye uh, at the same period of time here. Here's a comparison of Elbon versus Triticale. The Elbon is fully headed out. Uh, the Triticale has, has not yet given its growth. So when people ask about grazing, Triticale is always going to be better grazing than what rye is. But rye is earlier grazing. And sometimes that's more important for people. If you want to get your grazing and still get another crop in, it's more important to have early grazing than it is to have the best grazing. But rye is very good grazing, but when it's young. you got to keep it small. you got to kind of keep it flipped off and it will be uh, quite good forage. If you've got more time, Triticale will always give you more tons of better forage uh, for later on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a difference in growth between the Triticale and dry the benefit of growth? Yeah, so the question is, what's the difference between roots uh, with rye and Triticale? You know, Triticale is a cross between rye and wheat. Rye is going to have significantly more roots than what wheat does. I would put Triticale kind of in the middle. It's, I don't think it has as many roots or as deep a roots as what rye does, but it's, it's certainly far better than wheat as far as root mass that accumulates. Uh, I, I don't know, Paul, are you aware of any studies that have actually... It's really hard to, to weigh and measure roots because, you know, just so many of them break off when you're trying to dig them up. But, but the observations that I've had is it's not as good as rye, but it's better than wheat. Uh, another option is let covers grow later into the spring, as late as possible. Again, this is looking at soil health benefits of these later planted, fall planted cover crops. Uh, it is easier with beans than it is with corn because typically beans are planted a little later. Now, as Paul was saying, there is definitely increased risk on dry land. And when we do this on our dry land acres, we want to be ready and we want to be quick to pull the trigger on terminating that if it looks like the spring is going to turn off rather dry. But on our irrigated ground, or as we would move east, or in a relatively wet spring, we may look at letting this grow a little bit longer. And you can still let it grow a little longer, but not too long. And again, that's where that high level of management needs to fit, and it doesn't always fit in the system that you're currently using. You may have to adjust things a little bit. Nutrient management becomes much more important and important with corn. And I, I say you need to have more of an organic mindset. I, I like the, the term that uh, David Montgomery used, you know, organic-ish. And, and what I mean by that is organic farmers, they don't get all nervous if they don't have a corn planted by an April 10th. You know, they typically plant later because they don't have treated seed. Uh, they've just got other things. They're trying to let their cover crops grow for nitrogen fixation. They don't get all excited if they're not the first ones to get their corn in. And I think a lot of us would be better off if we had a little bit more of a mindset of that. So here's some examples. Uh, again, from this uh, things that were planted uh, around the 1st of October 2015. Again, remember this is a fairly mild winter, but here's here's a strip, and, and those plots that I showed you were right over on this edge of this field. So this is in the same field where we had all those plots with the, with the clover and the hairy batch and all this. So this was a, a mix of rye, triticale, oats, and barley. And uh, the oats and barley had both spring and winter varieties. So it's like a six-way mix of different cereals. And planted October 1st, and we sprayed this one out uh, April 1st, and we sprayed this one out about a month later. And so this still, you know, this, this is not excessive growth. I mean, this is not chest high or anything. But I want to show you the difference in the amount of residue that we kept on the soil simply by delaying the planting 
a little later here, April 30th versus April 1st. And you can see that there's already a significant difference here. This picture was taken just a few days after this was sprayed here. This had been sprayed, you know, over a month already. Uh, when you take a close-up looking straight down, you know, there's very little residue left here. You can see where the cover crop was, but because it had such a low carbon nitrogen ratio, because that was so vegetative at the time, and it's already been dead for 30 days, a lot of that is already starting to break down. And I've got a lot of bare soil. This is in soybean stubble. And again, like Paul was showing, in, in our soils, this has been no-till for 20 plus years. The, the biology is so active that the, the residue just does not stay around, especially with soybeans. There's not that much there in the first place. And so this has been no-till for many years, but we struggle to keep, to keep cover on the soil, especially in a relatively warm winter like this. Here's where we sprayed out 30 days later. Okay, the corn has been planted. We planted corn May 7th here. So the corn's already been planted. And you can see where the, the corn planter went through right here. This is right next to it. A significant difference just simply by waiting an extra 30 days. We felt like, you know, we did not, uh, you know, it, it did take extra moisture to do this. And, and again, that's where the trade-off comes. You know, am I going to spend my moisture growing this early on, kind of invest it early on, in order to have a better residue cover? Because I know I'm going to get better infiltration in a big range with this. I'm going to have less evaporation because of the ground cover that I do have. It's, it, it, and that's where it makes it hard. That there's no easy button when it comes to spring growing cover crops because you have to make the call on when you need to terminate that. And the less rainfall you have, the more difficult that decision is and the more important it becomes because you can definitely get yourself in a bind if you let your spring cover crops grow too much. And, and again, I don't necessarily have the answer as to you know, how big you can let it grow and, and gain that back on the back end with the better infiltration and less evaporation. There's, I'm sure there's going to be studies done on that, uh, but for right now, you know, we just, we try to keep an eye on what the weather's doing, and uh, we've had times when we sprayed it too late, and it's hurt our yield. We've had other times when we've hit it pretty good, and it's helped. So that's, uh, that's kind of a a little bit more of a management decision. This is on irrigated. This is in 2012, which is a very, very dry year, but we had a pivot right here, so we kind of made up for that. But this is very interesting here, too. This is a very warm spring, so we got things planted early. Uh, so this corn was planted April 20. This cover crop rye was planted the previous fall, and this rye was sprayed out uh, about 10 days before we planted corn. This is normally what we would do. We would try to spray our rye out about 10 days before we plant corn. Try to have it fairly well browned out before the, the planter goes in the ground. We left the strip here. This is a 90 foot strip that we didn't spray this rye out until the corn was already up pretty good. You can see the corn that's coming up here. So this was sprayed the 7th of May. So about three weeks, almost three weeks after we planted the corn. And I'll just kind of show you some of this. Again, we ended up, we had to run the pivot earlier because it was a relatively dry spring. Had this been on dry land, that would have been a disaster. There's no doubt about that. Because we did have to run the pivot to kind of make up for the extra moisture that this took. But what I want to show you is look at the difference in residue. This is the stuff that was, was sprayed out 10 days before we planted corn. Uh, and this picture was taken uh, May 11th. So, you know, corn's just getting coming. And there's... You know, there's no doubt that that's, that's plenty of residue there right now, but here's where the rye was sprayed out later. And uh, this this strip, this 90-foot strip of corn, for the first probably six, seven weeks of this corn growing, was shorter than the rest of the field. And I think primarily because it was stunted a little bit early on for some sunlight, because it was kind of tucked down in there. I've got another picture you can see here. This picture was taken a month later, or almost a month later, June 1st. And you can see where it was sprayed out later. I mean, that looks like that was full-blown wheat stubble almost, it looks like. This still has decent residue, but it's starting to kind of break down. And then just a kind of a close-up there. Uh, so even at June 1st, the corn just barely getting up above uh, the rye. So it was shorter than the rest of the field early on. Then it kind of got even. And then later on, it got taller than the rest of the field because yeah, that was a very hot, very dry summer. And uh, where we had this additional residue, it kept that soil cooler and, and the irrigation water probably stuck around a little bit longer. So here's going out to the middle of August. You can still see the early sprayed out stuff. I've still got good soil cover there. 
But look at how much residue I still have yet, the middle of August, where we left that grow a little longer. So again, I'm not recommending you do that. We don't do that as a general practice because it's kind of scary <laughs> to plant into that kind of stuff. And, and the other thing you have to do is you have to really, really manage your nitrogen well because when you get rye that big, it's going to have all of the nitrogen in your soil profile soaked up pretty good. And so you have to really manage the nitrogen uh, program on corn when you let rye grow that long because it's, uh, it's going to be tied up in that rye plant for the majority of the year. So you can't put your nitrogen on early if you're doing that type of system. Okay. Control of resistant weeds. Here, here's my opinion. When it comes to cover crop adaption or adoption, I think that we have moved from the innovators, I think most of the early adopters are in, and I would say that we're somewhere right here starting to get the early majority of farmers looking at and potentially using cover crops. And the reason that we're moving up into this phase, and I think it's gonna get up to here before too long, and the number one reason for this is going to be control of resistant weeds. Because innovators and early adopters, they're going to be more interested in the soil health benefits. That's, that's all of us that are here. Okay, we're, we're in these categories here. We are doing it for soil health reasons. These guys here, they're going to do it for this, in my opinion, this is going to be the number one reason you're going to see a lot more people jump on board with cover crops and uh, it, in, in the next several years. And I think it's already started to some degree. This, is a lot, this represents a lot of acres. And in order to, to fill all these acres, there's gonna have to, you know, big ag is starting to look at cover crops and cover crop sales. They've gone from what I would say, just standing on the sidelines and observing to I think they're kind of sniffing around and trying to figure out where they fit in now. But control of resistant weeds is gonna be a big, big factor in cover crop adoption. Here's a picture from that same field I was just showing you where we sprayed some out 10 days before and some three weeks after. This is the three weeks after strip. Here's a little corner that we just didn't get the drill in the ground fast enough, so there was no cover crop at all. You can see the corn coming up right here. All of this other stuff is mare's tail. Mare's tail loves bare soil in the spring, and it does extremely well because it germinates in cool soils. And when it comes up and there's no competition like this, you tend to have a lot of mare's tail. There is hardly any mare's tail at all out in the rest of this field. Mare's, cereal rye will control 99% of a mare's tail issue. It really does an extremely effective job uh, at inhibiting mare's tail and other weeds growth too. Uh, cereal rye contains a, a chemical compound called benzooxanine, and, and it's a chemical compound that inhibits the growth of these small seeded plants. And, you know, and we could, we could debate the alleliopathic effect of cereal rye on corn. Will it mess up the germination? I, there's probably some potential there. It does not happen very often. Generally what happens when you have yellow corn after cereal rye, it's because of a nitrogen cycling issue and not alleliopathy. But cereal rye, because of this compound and also because it is so aggressive at taking up nitrogen and releasing it very slow, it makes it very effective at weed control because many of your weeds, particularly pigweed and amaranth, uh, they are very dependent upon having uh, sufficient nitrates in the soil. And you will see very few weeds in a soil that doesn't have a lot of free nitrates. And so that's another reason why cereal rye is very effective as a weed suppressant. Here's a picture. Uh, this side of the field had cereal rye, very few weeds. This side of the field, uh, soybean field, had no cereal rye cover, weeds all over the place. Here's a fallow mix out in Tribune, Kansas. Uh, so this would be in place of summer fallow. They'll plant wheat here this fall. Uh, they had a cover crop, an oats-based cover crop here. A few weeds here on the end strips, but very few weeds throughout the rest of the field. This is just traditional chem fallow. Lots and lots of weeds out there. Here's on our own farm in 2015. This was a uh, rye planted the previous fall. We grazed it in the early spring. We drilled soybeans into this, and that's what it looked like. Uh, no, uh, I don't think there was any pre-plant herbicides put on this, uh, but hardly any weeds there. Closer up of that. And then here's the other side. We didn't get the cattle over to this side, so it did not get grazed. We planted straight into here. This is a picture where the uh, air seeder tire ran. So we planted straight into this rye. This rye was almost chest high. We planted into this. After we planted, we came back with a roller and we rolled this rye down because we felt like it was too much of a shading issue. So we tried to get it knocked down to the ground. 
<clears throat> and it just had a beautiful thick uh, thatch there. Uh, this is a picture later on in August. Uh, very few, very few weeds in here, and even in August, we still had excellent residue cover there. This is the, it was one of the cleanest fields of beans we had, and I think we probably only post sprayed this once. Uh, but even with the post spray, this is what the end rows look like where, because of end row compaction and whatnot, more weed pressure for sure coming in off the neighbors. But we did not have as good a stand of rye. The rye was not nearly as thick to provide that weed control benefit. Uh, there's, there was no shortage of amaranth seed in the seed bank there. So we feel like the cereal rye in particular can give us the best weed control, weed suppression benefits. But it's not the only thing. Here's a picture. This is from uh, my organic farmer, Jerry Laners in Hebron again. This is a, the same field I was showing you earlier. Uh, this was Harry Vetch, and he's rolling it down. He's got a roller, front three-point mounted roller on his tractor. He just, he's a small farmer, so he's got a six-row planter back here. So he basically, one pass through the field, he rolled the rye, and he planted uh, corn, uh, organic corn, right into this. And so this basically became both his fertilizer and his weed control. And I want to primarily focus on the weed control aspect here because look at the kill that he got on that hairy vetch and look at the weed control that he got. There's no chemicals on that whatsoever. Like I say, this guy's organic and, and he doesn't know if he can do this every year. I mean, because when he sent me these pictures, I was like, do you think you can do that every year? Because I mean, that's, that, that's some of the nicest looking fields I've seen. And he says, I don't know if I got lucky or what. Uh, the, the thing that he did not like is how late it got for him because this is the first week of June. So he's now changed his rotation. He's taken soybeans out of his rotation. He's going corn and then yellow field peas. He's following the yellow field peas with buckwheat for about 45 days. He's terminating the buckwheat and then coming in and getting his hairy vetch planted around the 1st of September. And then he's hopefully going to be able to come in and do the same type of program where he's rolling this down, but this will look more like May 20th instead of June 7th. That's, that's the hope, yes. The question was what rate of hairy vetch? This was about 30 pounds, 30 to 35 pounds of hairy vetch. Uh, some of the organic guys that, you know, they would do a, a vetch rye combination. He did not do any rye in this at all because he wanted to try to roll it, and by this point, that rye would have been fully headed out and made seed. So he's, he's looking at just a monoculture of vetch because he's just trying to grow as much nitrogen as possible. Yes? So the question was, could you do vetch and cereal rye and still crimp it? Uh, maybe. The, the problem is, is that rye would get out ahead. Uh, triticale and hairy vetch would probably be better because the triticale is going to be later maturing, so it would match up. The ideal time to crimp something is when it's flowering. And so you've got a window of opportunity with rye and with triticale when it's already put a head on and it's starting to shed pollen. That's when it's most susceptible to being roller crimped. If he had rye in here, it would have been far earlier than what the vetch would have been. So that would not match up. But triticale and vetch might. But again, his main goal is, is to grow as much nitrogen as possible. I, I don't know, if, he didn't take a clipping and send in, but he's got to have, I don't know, 160 to 180 pounds of nitrogen in that batch, I would think. It's, it's, I'll show you a picture of his corn here in just a little bit. There's a question in the back. And, and maybe you'll get to it in the next picture, how did the weed control last? Yep. Yeah, so the question was, how, how long did the weed control last? That's, that's what it looks like there. Uh, here's a little bit later on, still very, very clean field, uh, and here's when that corn is already tasseled, very few weeds, at least in that. I didn't go out and look at the field, these are pictures that he sent me, um, but he was very, very impressed. He's got a lot of neighbors talking. He had cleaner fields than most of his conventional neighbors who obviously put a lot of herbicide. And look at the color of that corn. You know, late in the season, behind just that hairy vetch, no, no manure, no, nothing else, just that hairy vetch and a previous crop of soybeans too, uh, some credit there, but pretty impressive. So if we could do that every year, I mean, that would be fantastic. Is it possible? It's probably possible, realistic, I don't know, we're learning, but it, it, it gives some things to kind of be excited about. Now, a way that you could do that, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't have equipment like this, you know, where you have a, and this isn't a very efficient system because you're, you're doing everything in one pass. 
If you do a separate roller crimper pass from your planter, you have to make sure they're really, you, you're very precise that you follow the same path and it's the same width. Uh, Don Biologic, who has a booth uh, downstairs, you can stop by and take a look. They're selling now an implement like this that mounts right on the front of your planter so you can do this same type of operation, basically a crimping operation right ahead of your planter and this mounts right on your toolbar. So here's a picture of that. Now this particular picture and I got this off their website. This is not anything that we did. They're they're running uh, they're running the row cleaners a little too deep, in my opinion. They're doing uh, more soil disturbance than I think is necessary. But what that does, uh, let's see, this part right here, it kind of pushes the the uh, the cover crop to each side, and then this kind of stomps it down. So it kind of leaves a path where you're going to plant the seed, where you've got that tall all that tall plant material pushed over to each side. So kind of a unique tool there. Like I say, if, if you're interested in that, I think the guys have a booth downstairs uh, that you can learn more about that. Okay, so weed control, again, in my opinion, is, is going to be one of the reasons that you're going to see a lot more people begin adopting cover crops. And, uh, you know, they're going to face some challenges because the best weed control from a cover crop is when you let it grow fairly big but that's also when you have the most issues with nitrogen tie-up, uh, more difficult to terminate, uses more water. So there's, there's trade-offs, and again, it re requires a high level of management. The longer you let it grow, the more you better be prepared to manage it. Okay, spring planted cover crops may be an option if fall planted ones did not happen. And uh, you know we've got some guys looking at planting oats, peas, lentils, chickling vetch, rape seeds, and things like that in the spring. Uh, you can plant these when your soil temperatures kind of get over 40 degrees and they look like they're going on their way up. I uh, have had some guys do this where they'll spray out the oats with select ahead of corn so they get rid of that grass out there, but they allow the legumes to keep growing and they may not terminate the legumes until after that corn has come up. That way they still get some of the weed control benefits, some of the soil building benefits of that grass with the oats out there early, but it's easier to get the corn going without having the grass and then they can take the legumes out later with the post spray. Again, the later you plant it, the later you let it grow, the more risk that there is, uh, but in irrigated or higher rainfall or a wet spring, these all have some options. Now there's a lot of people, again, in this whole uh, concept of opening up this window further, they're saying, well, can we get our cover crops planted earlier, particularly in the corn with this interseeding or companion cropping in the corn concept? Uh, a lot of research being done on this right now, a lot of excitement about it, um, some success and some failures. I've never seen it where it's hurt the corn crop. It's generally always been, where did the cover crop go? <laughs> because it just doesn't survive. The biggest challenge is here, crop insurance. Uh, you can't do this on a large scale, or you really probably can't do it at all without voiding your crop insurance. So those are gonna be issues to work through. Weed control issues. If you get something growing out there with your corn, it's gonna really limit what you can use for herbicides, uh, both pre and post. Uh, it's difficult to get in legumes to nodulate if you've dumped you know, 150 pounds of nitrogen out for your corn. And the biggest one, in my opinion, is just lack of adequate sunlight when you're trying to interseed. Uh, the benefits, it's a relatively easy way to grow, a it's, it's easy to seed the cover crop because uh, you know you, you that's generally a time of year when you have a little bit more time. Uh, if you've got the right equipment, it can make it easy. Some guys are broadcasting, that's not nearly as successful. The, the theory is that you get the cover crops to germinate and grow four to six inches before the corn canopy completely closes. That way it still has some sunlight to get itself established. And then it uh, hopefully can survive and live through the summer in a kind of a shady environment. And then as the corn dries down and the canopy opens up, plants grow again with cooler weather gives you better trafficability for fall harvest and it also can help with residue issues of corn on corn because if you have a cover crop growing out there your soils are going to be more biologically active and uh, you will have less residue so weed control uh, you know you can burn down with glyphosate you can post with some broadleaf herbicides if you don't have broadleaves in your companion mix uh, some of the guys up in canada they've had some decent success with this they're using verdict as a pre-emerged uh, pre-plant or pre-emerge and uh, been having because it doesn't have a long carryover they're getting by with that uh, again crop insurance dry years uh, it it does is has had more success as you move further north 
Just a few pictures here. Some guys are seeding it with a big rig like this where they're getting the cover crop seed blown down underneath the leaf canopy. I like that. Some will just simply surface broadcast it. You will tie up some seed in the canopy. This is another implement from Don Biologic. Uh, and there's some other companies um, coming out with some inner row seeding where you can actually drill the seed in the ground between the corn rows. And in my opinion, this gives you the best chance of having something work, something successful. Penn State's probably done more research on this than anybody else. So if you want to learn more about this, just Google uh, interseeding corn Penn State and you'll get all kinds of studies like this. Like I say, I've never seen a study. I've never seen a field where it's hurt the corn yield but more often than not, you just don't get much growth to feel like it was worth doing. I do have a few pictures here. Uh, Dean Kroll with the uh, University of Nebraska did a study. Uh, this was several years ago. He did a more extensive study this past year, but he hasn't sent me the pictures of that yet. Uh, this is a mix of ryegrass, cereal rye, crimson clover, and then we threw some mung beans in just to see what they would do. He actually had some pretty decent success with this. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to repeat it year after year. This is the best year that he had. But here's a picture of mainly the grasses where annual ryegrass and cereal rye growing. He did get some mung beans coming. It wasn't as consistent as what we would have liked. And this is all surface broadcast too. Since then, they've gotten a, a, a Henniker inter, a row interseeding unit. He got some clover growth out here. Again, I took, you know, obviously we took pictures of the best spots and not the whole field. But he did have some success. He even had some crimson clover uh, and put out some small blossoms here. And so he felt that, like that was you know, decently successful, but again, it was not as consistent and he hasn't been able to repeat it like we would like to see. Uh, again, some pictures of clover there. So we'd really like to see that work. I think that, I think that there's a lot of people working on some new technologies, new seeding equipment. But again, one of the biggest hurdles that we're going to have to face with that is crop insurance. So if that's something you're interested in, we can talk more about that afterwards here. In saying all these things of trying to open the window up further to have more of a window to plant cover crops, that doesn't really address the real problem. The real problem is most farms have a severe lack of crop diversity. You know, corn beans, corn corn, these are common rotations. Uh, or lack, common lack of rotations. The problem is, is that natural systems, the way God created these systems is to have a tremendous amount of diversity and uh, most of our cropping systems do not. So when you look at a natural native prairie, you know, there's dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of species all growing together out there. And then when you look at our cropping systems, you know, we're growing one thing uh, at a time and only maybe two things, three things maybe, you know, over the course of a rotation. So it's not very diverse at all. Dwayne Beck with South Dakota uh, State, uh, Dakota Lakes Research Center. So, you know, weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity to a system which lacks diversity. You know, showing all the weeds coming up in the field here. And he goes on to say that nature's efforts to add diversity can be countered in other weeds by adding beneficial diversity to the system. So having a more diverse cash cropping rotation or getting diversity into our system through a diverse cover crop mix. And that's what we like because, you know, it's difficult to get more diversity in your cash cropping rotation because if you're going to grow more and more cash crops, and I thought it was interesting, uh, the, <clears throat> I think, was it uh, uh, Dan DeSutter was talking about being over in Australia and he said 80% of the farms were doing how many different crops? At least five different cash crops. Very interesting. Most of us are good to get three and a lot of people only two. Uh, so this is some of the base rotations that we're looking at now, trying to get diversified. And we don't follow this completely, but you know, we're trying to you know, go from corn to a fall cover crop to like a bean, peas, or vetch. And then either go to rye, trit, barley, or we may spring plant some oats over here. Then go to a summer cover, or we might double crop some things. So anything that you can do to get more diversity in is great, but it is difficult. Because if you're going to add diversity through your cash cropping, you need specialized equipment a lot of times. You need a specialized knowledge to grow these things as a cash crop. And you need specialized markets to market these things. But if you're adding the diversity through a cover crop, you don't need any of those things. You don't need specialized equipment. You don't need specialized knowledge. You don't need specialized markets to plant a diverse cover crop mix because uh, the market is the soil, the equipment is a drill, and the knowledge is getting it in the drill and putting it in the ground. So, 
it's much, much easier to get diversity into your system through the cover crops. I want to just, uh, in kind of in, at the end here, I want to just show you one thing that we've done that, that works pretty well. We've got more interest in this all the time. Uh, it doesn't fit for everyone, but under irrigation or uh, in wetter climates, this, this and, and again, I put this up as an example of thinking outside the box a little bit. This is something that some of our customers in Kansas started doing and then we started using it because it worked pretty well, but it's the concept of doing double crop sunflowers with a cover crop underneath. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll grow a crop of a cereal, either barley or rye primarily, and immediately after cereal harvest, late June uh, through late July, but hopefully no later than the middle of July, we'll plant hybrid sunflowers, 20 to 30,000, and then we'll plant a variety of cover crops with it. We'll just mix all the seeds together. A lot of legumes here, a lot of flowering type plants, uh, and and uh, you know, the concern is the growing season length, adequate moisture in dry land, and then marketing. But there's, you know, there's places you can haul sunflowers. So this is what the seed mix looks like. We've got the hybrid sunflowers, uh, all the black little seeds, and then all the other seeds. We just mix it all together, put it in a drill, go out and drill it. And this is what it looks like uh, after about five to six weeks of growth. You can obviously see the sunflowers. The buckwheat is, is in, in blooming really nicely. One of the major pests of sunflowers is head moth. And when you have the buckwheat out there blooming, it attracts enough beneficial predatory insects that we rarely have head moth issues with these uh, planting sunflowers this way. Now later planted sunflowers are less susceptible, but we think the flowering plants as a companion with this certainly does help. Uh, crop diversity drives biological diversity, and biological diversity drives the system. And we just think that this is a really healthy way to do things. So here's a picture uh, of one of the legumes. You can see how it's nodulated and doing a good job adding beneficial nitrogen to the system. And not only do we have plant diversity, but there's also insect diversity. There's, there's honeybees on here. There's a couple different types of beetles on this one uh, sunflower head. So it's drawing in a lot of diversity above the ground, below the ground, and uh, also within the insect world. And they're really pretty too. You'll get a lot of people that want to come out and take their family pictures in your sunflower fields, especially in an area like ours where nobody grows sunflowers. This is what it looks like when it's ready to harvest. And this is kind of what's exciting about it. Uh, number one, sunflowers don't die with the first frost, so you have a longer window of time to grow this than what double crop soybeans would be. A lot of people do double crop soybeans. Double crop soybeans are dead with the first frost. Double crop sunflowers, you have to drop down to probably about 28 degrees to kill these things. So generally, in our area, that gives us an extra three weeks of time for these things to grow. And that's, that's a pretty big deal because we're on the northern edge of where double cropping can successfully work. So sunflowers, again, it opens that window of opportunity up for us. And then even after the sunflowers have died, you know, I've still got peas, I've still got batch, I've still got other things that are growing down underneath here. Uh, that can still be growing, fixing nitrogen, benefiting the soil even after the sunflowers have either died from maturity or from frost. Uh, we use a head like this to harvest them and it's, and it's kind of a nice system. Again, it doesn't fit for everybody, uh, but it, it's a testimony to, to these guys down in Kansas that, that started thinking outside the box. How can they have a cover crop and a cash crop uh, all at the same time? I want to just close my time here with uh, just this example. Uh, I call it a tale of two fields because these fields are side by side. And I think this is from two years ago now. Um, our, our neighbor, this is our neighbor's field. He was harvesting corn and we were harvesting soybeans side by side, both irrigated, both good farms, irrigated farms in our area. And you would think that from a residue and soil health you know, benefit, uh, this guy, look at all the residue he's got from, this is probably, you know, 230, 40, 50 bushel irrigated corn. Tremendous amount of residue there. This is soybeans, good residue, but we know this is going to break down pretty quickly. So you would think that from a residue standpoint, he would be much further ahead. He came in and bailed all his up because he could probably get, you know, $20, $25 a bale, and he felt like that was worth it. The same day he was bailing, I was over here drilling a diverse cover crop mix in our soybean ground. This is what it looked like the next spring at planting time. He had, even though he had all that corn, he's bailed his up and hauled it away 
And even though we had not nearly as much soybean residue, this, this actually, you can see where the planter, we planted this green, we had some vetch blooming, some crimson clover blooming, see a ladybug right there. This is a, a mix of, of legumes and grasses. This is mostly winter barley. You can see it a little bit headed out here. Planter had already gone through there. And so that was the difference. Uh, and again, it was just a field full of life. This is what his soybeans looked like coming up. We had some hard rains and it's crusted. You can kind of see how the, the water here, you can see it evaporated on top. It did not infiltrate and it's crusted and these soybeans are struggling to come up through that and just very, I mean, just no residue there whatsoever. And then here's our corn coming up. We terminated that cover crop after we planted the corn. Here's the corn coming up and I've still got some pretty nice residue. And so there's the side-by-side -side comparison. You know, there's no fence there anymore, but it's literally across the fence. And I look at that and I ask myself and I challenge other people, you know, which, which of these do you want to be? And, you know, if you're familiar with A Tale of Two Cities, you know, Dickens writes, he starts out, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And I would like to say this is the best of soil health and this is the worst of soil health. So which one do you want to be? And uh, that's, that's all I have. Uh, Paul, how much time do we have left? Okay, so we've got about a half an hour. What I'm going to do, you guys ask any questions you want about any of that stuff, any of the stuff that Paul talked about. I'm going to invite Paul to, to answer questions with me because he's got uh, years and years of experience as well with cover crops and crop rotations and all of that. So go ahead and ask us questions and we'll, uh, we'll kind of pass the mic back and forth here and talk. Yes. Okay, so the question was on the, when did we harvest the sunflowers that were planted? It's late because uh, they, they dry down fairly slowly. Uh, I don't know, Brian, do you remember? Generally, that's the end of November, first part of December before we got out there. Could have been harvested earlier, but they would have been wetter. So we just left them as long as we could without fearing that they were going to blow over or if it looked like the snow was coming in or something. But yeah, we would generally let them stand until the first part of December if we could. Just, just for dry down. Yeah. So Dan's question is on volunteer buckwheat because if that's and that's a good point. If you put buckwheat in a cover crop mix, just plan on it making seed because it will, and just plan on managing the volunteer because it's going to be there. Uh, we have not seen any issues. Buckwheat has been one of those things that has not been an issue to control chemically. Buckwheat is a little bit unique in that it will come up in cooler soils, but it tolerates no frost whatsoever. So you will often see a flush or two of buckwheat come up late in the fall and, and then freeze off. And you'll generally see a flush of buckwheat come in the spring because it, it warms the soil up enough to get a flush coming in the spring, but you get that late frost and it, 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 it will not survive any frost at all. So between it freezing off and it being relatively easy to control with with chemicals i've never seen an issue paul have you seen an issue in any of your plots yeah you know even organic i got organic guys that use buckwheat all the time and you know they have no chemical options but it it doesn't build up and become a problem or an issue at least not so far so you don't really mind it if you have like buckwheat or corn or something yeah. and uh, i mean you're not enough to put your yeah, and, and, and probably like in these sunflowers, the, the first year we did it, we had way too much mustard as a cover crop. We wanted mustard because we knew it would bloom and attract some of those beneficial uh, insects, but it also didn't freeze out when we thought it should. And so we had, we had a lot of mustard seed out there. And I don't know, Brian, would you say that, was that mustard hard to kill? That one year we had a lot of volunteer mustard. Uh, Yes. 
Yeah, so the, qu the, the question is on terminating cereal rye in the spring. Um, we generally haven't had a big issue killing cereal rye. Uh, I glyphosate and Brian, I don't know, you put, are you putting some, uh, uh, what are you putting with your glyphosate to kill the rye when you do spring burn down a rye? Well, yeah, I've used Clethodem or Sharpen. Yeah, Sharpen and, and we, we have used Clethodem or Select if you want it to die slowly. And, and we've done that at, sometimes ahead of soybeans where we don't mind it kind of dying slowly. If you're doing it ahead of corn, I, you kind of want to get it killed out and let it start dying out so that you don't, you know, extend that dying period because that's kind of when you can have some issues with alleliopathy. Paul, what, what are your comments on termination of cereal rye? Well, it depends a lot on what the growth stage is. If it's already uh, jointed, uh, you need that translocated glyphos or something like that in there. Uh, I've done uh, quite a bit of work with uh, spraying cereal rye that tall, planting corn using Lumax. Atrazine takes out a lot of your cereals. The Callisto and Lumax will take it out too. They're both root uptake. When they're that size, root uptakes work. When they're jointed, then it doesn't. That's why you need the translocated in there. And so, like I say, I've sprayed a lot that height. Now, Dave Brandt, he can plant green. He lets his grow a lot longer. He's using his to dewater soil rather than drain tile. Me, I'm in half the rainfall, Dave. So he's got to use Roundup or a roller or something to get that stuff to die. But again, depends what growth stage you're in. The good news is with his, his will hang around a long time. Mine in that early vegetative stage, mine disappears in a hurry. But again, I'm not looking for biomass. I'm looking for a living root in that off season. Difference between cereal rye and rye grass. Rye grass is, uh, can be an annual, it's usually a perennial, but the rye grass itself, uh, in its first fall of growth, is setting a lot of root reserve to come back. A lot of people like all those roots. Uh, cereal rye was bred for grain production. It's putting its emphasis above the ground. Now when it comes to the springtime then, they wake up a little bit differently. But well, even when you talk to the Oregon Ryegrass Commission, they say it needs at least 60 days of growth before killing frost. When I'm seeding uh, my after corner bean harvest, I probably already had a killing frost. Ryegrass is not even on my list. Cereal rye is. So the big difference on when you're planting, which one do you want to go with? We got some producers in Nebraska that do hybrid seed corn production where they're flying it on. Uh, when they're doing mail row destruction, they can get that 60 days growth. They love the ryegrass. It's uh, the deep root system. It's an extra nit excellent nitrogen scavenger because they over fertilize and over irrigate seed corn production because it's a high value crop. Why not grow it in a biological form? Uh, the rye grass also gives them fall grazing because they're going to graze for any downed ears. And again, in seed corn production, there might be a few. It gives them some quicker grazing. Cereal rye seeded after harvest, I don't get that a benefit. So again, what's your situation? I'll, I'll address that just a little bit too. Uh, like Paul said, cereal rye and annual ryegrass are both very, very deep rooted crops. Annual you know, ryegrass does not have nearly as much above the ground biomass to take the chemical in to kill that deep root system. Plus, if you look at it, it's kind of got a shiny, almost kind of a waxy type leaf, so it's a little harder to get that chemical to penetrate. So, uh, the, you can kill annual ryegrass and you can do it very effectively if you follow the rules. Uh, it's pretty weather dependent. You, you have to spray, you know, on a day when that plant's actively growing, it needs to be relatively warm. Uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be 70 degrees, but you don't want to be spraying it on a 40 degree cloudy day. Uh, and uh, don't skimp on your surfactants and stuff like that. So if you're using ryegrass, it can be very effective. Like, like Paul said, you got to get it planted a little sooner in order to get it to overwinter. And then the management, I say, would say, is a little more difficult than cereal rye, but it's mostly about timing. And the guys that get themselves in trouble are the guys that don't have their own sprayer, and they hire the co-op to do it. And so the co-op's out there anytime they can to spray. They're not doing it when it should be done. They're doing it when it works for them. So it can be done. There's their Oregon Ryegrass Commission. Some of the guys are here. They've got Oregon Ryegrass coats on. Catch them. Or they've got a really good website. I think it's it just ryegrass.com or OregonRyegrass.com or something like that. They've got some really good uh, tips 
uh, on there about how to terminate rye, annual ryegrass. Yes. Yeah, so you're saying if you've got herbicide resistant weeds with your cover crop and then you want to plant green, then what are your options? Well, you know, with soybeans, I mean, you know, you're looking at uh, if you plant like a Liberty bean or a dicamba bean, I mean, you can, you know, with dicamba, you have really clean fields, but boy, you better, you better really watch what you're doing. Get it early as opposed to waiting too long. Uh, the Liberty bean fields I've seen around have been have been pretty clean too. You're going to have to do something like that to, to get that, uh, you know, rolling. You may kill your rye with a roller or the majority of it, but a lot of the weeds likely would not be terminated very well with the roller. So you're just going to have to kind of look at your chemistries and uh, look at what's going to be most effective. So when it comes to doing any post-emerge spraying, read the label. Most of your rates in your post-emerge products are for two-inch tall weed, occasionally four-inch tall weed. By the time you notice you have Roundup resistant weed or whatever resistance, uh, a lot of those are two to four foot tall. Doesn't, there's no product out there labeled to even take those out. And that's actually how we develop resistance in a lot of these weeds. It's like you getting your flu shot. We've taken weeds way outside of the window of control and we've treated a low rate of herbicide because we want to save some money. We gave them their flu shot. Uh, so we taught them that themselves. Uh, the good news is, though, if I got a good cover, usually I don't have the resistant weeds. And that's actually what I threw up here next. I've got, it actually fits with these questions. I spray a lot of my cereal rye out about that tall. Like I say, Lumax, take that out. Uh, or the roller. Uh, this is Rodale Institute looking at the roller. Uh, again, from Ralph Derps, just organic. There's no herbicide there. That's black oats rolled down there. But again, uh, on uh, Green Cover had a plot uh, several years ago, and this is, uh, I believe this is barley at a 20 pound rate on the left side and a 40 pound rate on the right side, but look at the gap between the two for the mare's tail. 20 pound rate, you can see one or two, and there in the 40 pound rate, you didn't see them. And so again, getting that winter cereal crop out there really decreases the mare's tail. Now, I'm lucky I don't have Palmer to deal with yet. In the areas where we do have Palmer, again, uh, Mother Nature's an opportunist. If there's a gap there, they're going to put a weed there. And if I get a good cover there, it's going to take care of it. Um, this is an interesting set of plots. This uh, producer, uh, this is getting ready for wheat in the fall. This is soy, or sunflowers is a previous crop. So he did a spring cover, but he purposely plugged one opener in the drill. So every pass he did, he could see how much weed control there was. Look at all the weeds. That's just common oats, suppressing weeds. If you don't have something growing, Mother Nature will put something there. Now, I got a project started uh, back in 2005. Carbon versus nitrogen is my covers, is what I'm using. This is simply bin run grain sorghum, bin run soybeans. When people talk about cover crop being expensive, bin run grain sorghum is about 50 cents an acre, seed cost. Now, bin run soybeans, I got to warn you, you can't really do that. If you got some Roundup Ready history, you got crop protection issues to worry about, you got to go non GMO if you're on a bin run or leftover seed, whatever. Again, I like them because they both frost kill, and I'm planting corn in that the next year. Uh, but on the, the day we're going out to do our early pre-plant herbicide on our corn, I may need to point out here, uh, this is a scene between the milo and the, this is a scene between the milo and the beans after frost. I moved over one the next year when I took the picture. I forgot where I was standing. But the picture the next year, 50 cents worth of grain sorghum seed. How much volunteer wheat do I have? Mother Nature didn't need to start the volunteer wheat because the sorghum was already there. Now, they're in strips. The beans weren't quite as impressive. There's some little bit of volunteer wheat there in the bean strip. Now, since they're in strips and our sprayer is wider than that, we had to spray the entire field, but I could have saved one herbicide application. So where you have all that, there's no cover crop? This is no cover crop here. This, the cover crop was simply grain sorghum. Real simple. But again, volunteer wheat's a grass, the sorghum is a grass, Mother Nature said, I don't need a grass growing there. Now also we already have anhydrous put on here, a lot less soil disturbance here. That was when we were doing our early pre-plant herbicide in early April. 
Corn's up and growing. It's time for post to merge. Oops, that's not the pointer. Again, to the line where the grain sorghum cover crop was, there's no post merge needed. Where there was no cover crop, even though it had a residual pre, it still needed post merge. Again, that was a cheap cover for weed control. And a lot of our researchers, all they report on is what is my yield the next year? No, I look at other, I look at the profitability. Later in the season, there's the grain sorghum side. Later in the season, there's the no cover side. Again, a little bit of cover goes a long way for weed control. If you don't have something growing, Mother Nature will put something there. Here's the fun one. Come back the next year, it's going into beans down there. And the cover in front of the beans after the corn harvest was cereal rye, austrian winter peas. They were both sprayed out. And you notice locust trees, perennial. Our farm manager said, you're gonna quit those covers. The deer are coming up, grazing the cover, and they're uh, planting locust tree seeds with a little charge of fertilizer. You know what I mean? They ate the tree pods down in the creek. When I pulled up the plot map and actually looked, this six rows is the no cover. This was the grain sorghum cover. This is the soybean cover. Again, this is staying roughly the same place. The locust trees, I think the deer grazed everywhere when they're out there, because they actually graze on the wheat. They weren't grazing the covers. There was actually locust trees in the corn year as seedlings. Second year, they're established trees now. But again, even that grain sorghum residue there suppressed the locust tree seeds such that I didn't have locust trees coming. And so again, a lot of people haven't looked enough at this weed control, and our weed scientists haven't either. I found this strictly by accident. Spent a little bit of time out there with a tore down bottle and a set of clippers clipping those trees off because at that growth stage in beans, there is nothing that takes out an established tree. Growth regulators in corn, you can, but there's nothing in soybeans you can take them out with. Again, once they're established as a perennial, you can't do it. Yeah, your flex head would take them out. Oh, flex head takes them out. <laughs> then they grow a little bushier next year. <laughs> this is uh, this year after a uh, wheat harvest. Uh, I got some uh, strips I've planted. I'm uh, doing a residual or a nitrogen contribution of cover crops. So in the wheat stubble, I planted different covers. And this is my 14-way blend on the border. This one is going to have a nitrogen treatment next spring. Look how many weeds are there compared to the 14-way blend. Other side of this sprinkler line. That's the same weed you just saw. Very few weeds here. That is a simple cover there. That's simply chickling vetch. Something is growing. Mother Nature didn't have to grow something. You never sprayed anything on that weed stubble? Nope. I find, I, the question is, did I spray anything on the wheat stubble? When I first started doing this research, I said I'm going to wait for the first flush of volunteer wheat, spray it out, and then plant my cover. I gave up so much growth on covers, I said, no way. I plant my cover the day the combine leaves the field. I hope. Then I don't have volunteer wheat. I don't have to spray weeds. Now, anytime I wait, even a week, I've got weeds. This is, you know, that's, Chuckling vetch, see how many weeds are there. The weed population in that field is fairly consistent across the field. So again, get something growing, Mother Nature won't have to get something growing for you. I had a couple of closing thoughts I threw into mind, depending on how long we went. Uh, and again, since we were supposed to focus on Great Plains, High Plains, lesser rainfall, I got a lot of producers say, I can't do a cover, I don't have enough rain. They roll up the residue, haul it away, they let weeds grow. That's the same one that says, I can't grow a cover. Well, if your weeds can grow, your cover can grow. Haul the residue away, Keith already showed you don't want to do that. I had an opportunity to go to South Australia. Now, I don't know about your guys' rainfall. I feel blessed when I get 25, 26, eastern Nebraska. Western Nebraska gets 10, 15, it depends where you're at. This is an area of eight to 10 inches of rainfall. The guys are using covers now. To the line. Cover, no cover. I was amazed. I was there after they spent about three weeks at 120 degrees. And I was there, they were glad a cold front come through and it was 90. That cover, I looked at that and I said, that's a failure. That farmer was excited like you would not believe. He says, that cover doubles his yield. And I thought about, and I showed you pictures of what mine looks like in wheat stubble. 
the thing is, when it had 120 degree air temperature, their soil temperature would reach 150 to 160 degrees. When it comes to soil biology, it kills all soil biology. Throw a steak on the grill. 130, it's rare and it's safe to eat because you killed everything. That little bit of cover was enough to feed the soil biology. Now, that little bit of cover, this is one of the sunflowers, it was blooming, it was only this tall. That's all the root it had. He didn't raise much biomass, but he had something living there to feed the soil biology that doubles his wheat yield. Where he didn't have cover, he still had some soil biology. Where he didn't plant some cover, there was no moisture at all. That sunflower wouldn't even grow. And again, you're amazed when you start seeing what happens to the soil biology. Get that living root out there. I don't know on that. I wasn't there during the hot spell, never measured any temperatures with him. He never thought about measuring it. He's just excited his wheat yields are doubled. I say my covers look a little better, but again, minor frost kill. I showed you the planter going into that the next year, but I had that living root putting carbon into the soil from July through whenever the frost and winter kills it. In the spring, I'm trying to save my water. It's not uncommon to see temperature differences of 30 to 40 degrees between covered soil and bare soil, you know, in the summertime. I, you know, a lot of guys will put the thermometers out there and 30 to 40 degrees is not uncommon. And that's huge. It's huge. Yes? So the question was, are you talking seed cost or overall cost? Yeah, you know, seed cost will, will it'll vary. You know, if you're like tightwad Paul over here and you just use some bin run grain sorghum. Uh, you know, generally when we send cover crop seed out, you know, probably our average seed mix is between 20 and $25. Uh, and, and I should say, an average mix without a lot of legumes. Legumes will increase the cost of your seed mix pretty quickly. The trade-off is you're growing your own nitrogen. Uh, so a, a mix with without a lot of legumes, you know, we've done, um, you know, we've, we've had guys say, well, I only want to spend 10 bucks. Well, you can do that. You don't get a lot of diversity and you don't get any legumes. But, uh, you know, around 20 to $25, you're going to get, uh, you know, quite a bit of diversity out there and, and, and a pretty good amount of seed. Uh, like the guy that was growing that 30, 35 pounds of hairy batch, I mean, he's got 60 bucks an acre in that seed, but I wish the fertilizer bill for my irrigated corn was only 60 bucks. And, well, fertilizer and weed control, because it was both for him. So that's going to be kind of the ballpark range. John, you had a question? Yeah, so the question is how long does it take to establish a system like this and get it really working for you? I, you know, I mean, it, the, the first time you do it, you're going to get it established. I think the, the benefits are uh, incremental and, and uh, they, they build upon each other. Uh, so generally what we'll see, we'll, we'll see the same soil benefits if we're doing no-till and cover crops together. We'll see the same benefits in three years that it would probably take 10 to 12 years to get with no-till alone. Would, would you say that's, yeah, and, and if you, you know, add manure or integrate livestock, livestock will speed that process up. Properly managed livestock will speed that process up even more. So it all depends on the system, but the cover crops are adding the additional carbon to the system that you don't get strictly from no-till. And that's why no-till can benefit you know, you'll see a fairly sharp increase in some soil health indicators with no-till and then it really levels off uh, because you, you've improved a lot of things structurally with the soil, but you haven't, you know, the biology is not being ramped up and you're not adding additional carbon to the system. I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow when I talk about the carbonomics too. Question on temperature. Uh, the first day of summer, so June 21, I was out on a research farm and I was waiting for someone to drop off delivery. They were late. So I pulled out the digital thermometer and I just played a little bit. 
Here's the thermometer on the shade side of the barn, infrared thermometer just off the side of the barn, 86 degrees there. I converted it to metric because I showed this data down in Australia. Locked out the soybean field, should back up one. That's what the soybean field looked like. That's been no-tilled about 20, 25 years. It has cover after the wheat. It's in a corn, bean, wheat rotation. After the corn, there's no cover. I've got different projects that I'm doing, different covers. Cover one in three years, cover every year, cover two years out of three, that type of thing. So this was uh, corn into the cover that was into the, the wheat, but then here's the beans. There's ferro residue cover out there. And like you say, that's what I was looking at for the field. That's the air temperature. This is about one o'clock. The driver's supposed to show up at one. So this is 86 degree air temperature. The crop canopy, evaporative cooling from transpiration of the crop is only 76.5. Now I'm showing roughly the average. I actually shot uh, five different places of each of these shots. And I picked the one closest to the average. 76.5, so it's a little cooler because the crop does evaporative cooling. That's transpiration. There's where water goes when it's hot out. The bare soil has not much bare soil. 133. Again, a steak on a grill, 133, that surface layer would be safe to eat. Now, down a little deeper, I don't think it's 133 yet. But again, this is only June 21. This is the first really hot day. We're coming into summer. Surface of the residue, at the top layer of the residue, the sun's beating down on that, and anybody's walked on bare soil or bare residue, it can get hot, 124. Pull away that little thin layer of residue, 76. Protect that soil, residue. That's what no-till is all about. Protect it with something living to feed the soil, that's what cover crop is about. The residue will protect the soil, but it doesn't feed the soil. Well, it does a little bit as it breaks down, but it's pretty slow. Brian Lemmy was no-till in the plains at the time. This is the actual air temperature on a summer uh, three-day tour. Those are three different fields, three different days. Uh, the top one is the air temperature. Bare soil temperature, residue. This was all in growing corn. Pulled away the residue, look at the temperature, and he actually dug down two inches deep. Look at the temperature. Again, residue makes a big difference. Get that sun off that soil surface. Again, growing leaf will absorb that energy and trans make that energy into something else in the soil. The covers will do even better yet. This is strictly residue on this example. What do you guys think of the vertical till craze and the breakdown residue? <laughs> <laughs> he, he turns it over to me because I, as extension, I'm not supposed to talk negative about anything <laughs> because they're, they're out there to sell their equipment. But I'll put it this way. When I've run vertical tillage, it's never paid. I already showed you my vertical tillage tools, my drill, cuts the size of the residue, puts the residue in contact with the soil, gives the living root to feed the soil system so it breaks down residue faster yet. Deanne Presley did a pro project down in Kansas where looking at vertical tillage, that's exactly the layer you do not want to disturb when it comes to soil biology, the interface of air and soil. She found one pass of vertical tillage tool on her average. Now there's some that did, some that didn't. Cut infiltration in half because it disturbed that layer the interface. And again, when it comes to me conserving water, that's probably one reason it's never paid for me. Anything I do to disturb that layer is going to hurt me. Now, as far as breaking down residue, I'm the other way. I got to get more residue out there. I have done extension field days with vertical tillage tools to show how it cuts and sizes the residue. You know, for the farmer who doesn't have biology, for the farmer who is going to be fall chiseling in Minnesota, he might love a vertical tillage tool. He loves a shredding corn head. He loves anything that's gonna make that corn stalk go through that chisel plow, because he has no soil biology. It, it's a biological issue, or lack of biology, why they have too much residue in the first place. <coughs> yeah. Uh, when it comes to the multiple year cover crops uh, questions, uh, one and two, two and three, so on, I'm even doing different things on those. 
The original study I did was corn, bean, wheat with cover after the wheat and cover after the corn, so it's two of the three. Beans are, after the, beans are harvested, wheat seeded immediately, so there's no room for cover. On that one, I've run it, this is the year 13 on it. In the first 12 years, two years, statistically, my corn yields took a hit. Those two years is because I didn't have enough nitrogen on in the carbon cover crop to feed the soil microbes. Once the system started working with me, statistically, covers never hurt the yield. The better news is out of the 12 years, there were three years, there was enough yield increase to pay for the cover crop seed for all 12 years because the soil is healthier. There's no cover immediately in front of the wheat. The wheat yields are statistically higher where there were covers before because it's a healthier soil. The beans have never been lower yield and as far as upper yield, they've never been enough to really to pay for the seed for all 12 years like the corn did. But there was one year I picked up 25 bushel of corn by having a cover out there. And that pays for a lot of cover crop seed. And I say that on all seriousness for the people who say, I tried cover crops one time and it didn't work. Maybe that was the one year you didn't get it seed right. Maybe you didn't get it terminated right. Maybe it didn't grow right. Once you learn, you'd be amazed. It's a long-term investment in the soil. In Southeast Nebraska, we had a lot of terraces. I asked people there, you know, did that terrace ever pay for itself? No, but it's keeping the soil there so my grandson can farm it. That's what cover crops are doing for me, is keeping the soil healthy for the next generation to farm it. Again, when you look at it, cover crop that way, now you learn to manage it. Like I say, I'm afraid of using water. I'm killing a lot of them early, but at least I'm feeding the soil. I'm adding diversity. My corn bean rotation, my cover crop there is Sarah Rye and Austin winter peas mixed. I got my corn, some warm season grass, beans, warm season legume. My two covers are the cool season grass and legume. I'm getting diversity in the system. Now, one year out of three, uh, I got one project where it's a uh, three-way grass to a six-way grass, depending upon the year, with a six-way to a nine-way legume versus the 14-way diverse versus no cover. I can definitely tell you this, in front of corn, heavy carbon cover crop, you better put on some extra nitrogen close to your row of corn. My three to six, or my six to nine-way legume has always paid for itself with extra corn yield for nitrogen. But I'm going in wheat stubble, and wheat stubble needs extra nitrogen anyway. So again, depends upon your system's approach.